And now we're pleased to introduce you to our first speaker. All right. Um, and Dr. Don Recker, would you like me to go ahead and do your whole intro here? Uh, do whatever, whatever you would like. Beautiful. Well, I think you deserve it, so I'm going to go through it. <laughs> so Dr. Dunn Rucker is the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he leads the formulation of federal health IT strategy and coordinates federal health IT policies, standards, programs, and investments. Now, Dr. Rucker has three decades of clinical and informatics experience, Highlights include co-developing the world's first Microsoft Windows-based electronic medical record, serving as chief medical officer at Siemens, and practicing emergency medicine for a variety of organizations. Now, Dr. Rucker would like to encourage all of you to be thinking of questions because there will be time set aside at the end of his remarks to provide answers. So Dr. Rucker, thank you for being with us today. And now the floor is all yours. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, first of all, um, Welcome everybody to the UHIN conference. Um, um, obviously, I think we all wish we could um, be there in person. Um, I know I certainly wish I could be there in person, not the least of which is I actually um, have, a, have a residence in Utah, but um, am in DC as, as it is. So I think as we look at um, health information exchange, right, as we look at the at the point of, of our meeting here these uh, two days, clearly there's a just a much richer, much accelerated national um, awareness of the need for health information uh, brought about by COVID. Everybody who's had a telehealth visit has had that brought home to them. Um, and of course, you know, in a world of, you know, Zoom conferences, I think we're all, I mean, in our daily lives in a way that even, you know, three quarters of a year ago we weren't, are now intimately familiar with, you know, considerations of interoperability and some of the things that work and don't work. That current awareness, um, I think, is highlighting um, a number of things. Um, one of which is obviously the extraordinary role that the health information exchanges have been playing in providing a, a, a backbone of that. And we anticipate this will grow with great rapidity. And I think you will see um, you know, additional federal incentives um, on that. And we'll talk a lot more about um, the unique role that we're seeing with um, you know, the, the, re, the state and let's see the, in some large um, municipalities, the local HIEs play uniquely in COVID and the entire spectrum of public health data. But before we get into that, let's, let's step back a little bit and think about the broader surround of healthcare. And what you've seen um, really is, is a desire for us to have healthcare in a seamless consumer powered way with our data where we want our data. Of course, our data, not anywhere where we don't want our data, arguably uh, sometimes in modern technology, the bigger challenge. The, the, the concepts here really are, we want a consumer experience and the infrastructure for that consumer experience that um, comes to our smartphone, gives us our medical records at our fingertips, gives us information, gives us actionability, gives us transparency on what we're getting, gives us information on, on the payment system, our part of the payment system. We want these things to be consumer grade. Increasingly, the old um, it's in the EMR type of stuff. And of course, it's, as Sarah mentioned, I've been around uh, from before the it's in the EMR days. But um, you know, now at this stage, we're really beyond just the EMR as an isolated static type of repository. We're really in the networking. And that consumer experience brought out to the smartphone um, and empowered with an entire back end to enable that to happen. That is what we jointly need to work on. That is what Congress 
um, set in place with the 21st Century Cures Act. And I think it's worth reflecting a little bit on some of the, some of the details there uh, for, for folks. So what the, the vision of Congress was really just what we've outlined. Um, that's frankly the vision of uh, both parties. Um, uh, the Cures Act was signed by President Obama. Um, we've done a vast amount of work under President Trump with his um, leadership in getting this implemented. And what were are, what are the three three big parts of the Cures Act to be aware of? I'm going to get into TEFCA, which I know is a lot of interest here. The Trust Exchange Framework Common Agreement, um, linking data with the HIEs. I'll save that for third. Um, and start with uh, the two broader ones. The first, um, and those are the prohibitions against information blocking and the requirement for application programming interfaces, quote, without special effort, unquote. And so what, so let's start with information blocking. What does that mean? That's sort of a, a, a you know, government kind of uh, generated term. What it means is quite simple, actually. It means that providers are now required under that law to provide patients with their data in actionable ways, not just go to medical records and get a photocopy, but in computationally actionable ways. Um, that's what it is. There are a number of, it, it covers the folks who are affected by it are um, health information exchanges, certified electronic health record vendors and providers. And there's, um, for the, certainly on the provider side, the quote disincentives provisions there, there's still a lot of um, internal work going on on rulemaking there. So stay tuned for that. Those things have, um, they're worked on. So, you know, and those will, th those provisions will be out for a public comment um, type of rulemaking. So everybody will have a have a chance to comment on those provisions. Um, we are at ONC Office of National Coordinator, which I lead. We're a um, staff division within the broader cabinet agency of Health and Human Services. We were charged with putting the rulemaking together on that. Um, we have some exceptions to protect patients' privacy, security, the technical feasibility, things like allowable network downtime. It's a complicated ecosystem with the allowable fees um, and a word there, right? For patients, this data is part of their getting care, just like you would do discharge instructions. We pay a vast amount of money, um, both privately and through the federal, um, federally taxed dollars for healthcare in America. And the, you know, the laws that the patient has, has their data. Um, obviously, we'll want to have um, the developers be able to get, you know, good return on investment and send innovation. That leaves the providers potentially a little bit of a thing because you're really ultimately, if you have an EHR product of some type or something similar, you're not just going to switch, be able to switch it out likely. So we have provisions uh, protecting providers so they can't just be sort of um, charged um, fees that don't bear relationship to the costs of providing the service. So we believe we have done with um, literally roughly 2000 public comments with several hundred stakeholder meetings, um, including input from uh, UHIN and, and meetings. Um, we believe we have something that in the final um, uh, rule, you know, ONC interoperability rule is a very um, pro-public, um, serviceable balance to all of that. As you know, the rule itself has been, um, the time dates have been shifted as of a couple of weeks ago because of COVID. You go, if you go to healthit.gov, you can see the new dates. Um, nothing else about the rule has really changed. There are a couple, you know, minor technical edits um, that are really more, you know, word completion type things. But the commitment to Interoperability is a hundred percent there, but we have to be mindful of the impact of COVID on the technical ability of providers to uh, participate in that. So information blocking prohibition, 
part one of the Cures Act and our role to interoperability. Part step two is Congress heard a lot about very bespoke customized application programming interfaces that, that you know, generated large fees, generate prevention of access. Um, and Congress basically said, no, <coughs> you have to use standardized application programming interfaces. Um, and this is in particular for patients to get their medical records electronically from their provider's electronic medical record under their HIPAA right of access. Um, that is the, the, the first and foremost thing. And for that use, um, we have a number of standards around the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resource, the US Core Data for Interoperability, to really make that a standardized package. The law actually requires all data, um, as folks uh, attending this meeting um, very well know, all data is not standardized. So we've come up with some, you know, I think workable ways to, um, and this is now, you know, three years down the road in, in effect, to meet the intent of, of the law with the technology that's available. But you know, we're starting uh, two years down the road. You, you can see the exact dates on our uh, website with the US core data for interoperability um, in terms of the API requirements. There are some earlier requirements if asked for data and various ways you can share it as those APIs are being built out called content and manner for what that, that is worth. But th with the core data, you get the meds, you get the problem list, you get the notes, and everybody can have a shared clinical picture of the patient the way that I would um, you know, expect to receive sign out from a colleague when I start an ER shift or when I'm ending an ER shift, my colleagues would expect that, that sign out or a consultant, right? The way clinicians talk about patients, that is, um, that is uh, there, so very powerful. The other part of application programming interfaces, and, and I, I do want to say that, um, well, we'll get, to, we'll do that, Tefka. The other part is as we're moving to fire APIs over time, this is a process over time, um, and we're not, you know, uh, you know we're, we're still going to use the, all the current APIs, it is a you know evolutionary process over years. Um, as that moves forward, one of the things that we identified um, in talking with with folks is really that while the the fire standards were fine for an individual patient query, right? My smartphone app, I'd like to get my record and then have my smartphone app do something with it. Um, they really didn't get at sort of a population of patients, right? Something that a provider delivery system might want to elegantly do analysis of their patient population, or frankly, that a payer would want to do to figure out which providers to um, contract with. And from a public policy point of view to really hold um, providers accountable. We, our current mechanisms for um, understanding, quote, value in healthcare, frankly, when you think about it, are really not modern. They're not really data-driven. Um, they were state-of-the-art when they were done, but they're really not sort of a long-term go-forward strategy. Um, you know, the quality measure game, um, again, state-of-the-art when it was there, we're now going to be able to do larger and larger data sets and really go away from these sort of very narrow bespoke quality measures to much richer analytic um, pictures of the provision of care. Uh, so I think you're going to see that transition. We have put in, um, because the standard uses HL7 uh, Fire version four, there is a bulk data standard um, for a population of patients. Now, it's worth understanding when you look at that, that that population requires a HIPAA treatment payment operations type of contract. That is a covered entity business associate. That is not just some on-demand deal. You can just get records. That is a written 
negotiate a contract between providers and any you know covered entities um, and their you know their business associates. So um, it is really for the convenience of those parties to lower transaction costs. And part of the work we've been doing at ONC over the last couple of years to make healthcare the back end more efficient. We're doing a lot of stuff on linking clinical administrative data as well. That's a longer term project on things with prior authorization. Maybe we'll get in that in the Q&A process. But again, it's a there's a lot of work going on to, to make us more efficient and to really have um, just the, the grinding burden on providers and patients um, to really start automating that as well. So the third part of the Cures Act is um, Congress heard, uh, you know, it's interesting when you see these laws or when, when you're involved in, in making federal rulemaking um, and you want to be, you know, you know, reasonable about it. And as somebody who's been in the private sector for um, 30 odd years, and this is really my first time as a government regulatory agency employee, I've always been on the other side of it. I've been one of the people who's had to read the rules and scratch, you know, my remaining hair on like, what were they thinking kind of thing. So I'm extremely sensitive to what, um, what we put out. Um, in this and, and um, you know, running the process in a way that uh, minimizes um, these things, but yet hits the goal of public empowerment. So it's interesting in that context to think about what, you know, what, what did Congress hear? Why did they put this and make this a law? And what Congress heard was a lot of providers said, you know, we have a hard time exchanging information. Um, you know, it, it's problematic. I, don't think as much they were hearing this from providers in Utah, because I think Yuhin has done a has done a bang up job here. Um, but you know, in other parts of the country, as folks may know, um, things you know still need some further progress. And and there are some parts of the country that don't actually have health information changes, so that's a pretty small minority. So, what um, what Congress heard was. Um, these networks should sort of talk to each other. And so Congress put that in as the trusted exchange framework common agreement. Um, and so we're implementing with the Sequoia Group recognized whom we've um, designated on a contract as a recognized, as the recognized coordinating entity to really work with the health information exchanges and get sort of the various um, Backend interoperability stack processes that includes, um, you know, the data use agreements that are signed with folks. They, you know, a lot of energy has gone into those technical protocols, uh, governance rules. To get all of these things more in sync, and you will see more of that over the over the next year. Um, so those are the parts of of the Cures Act. They're, they're moving along, I think, at a very solid pace um, to get us into this modern world. But let me talk some more about health information exchanges um, and what we've seen with COVID. COVID has really opened our eyes to the absolute requirement that um, we have this data to share as we've had to virtualize and have not had really access to, you know, sort of in place electronic medical record. Um, how do we get data? That's one big thing. The other big thing is um, for a variety of policy reasons, um, over the last 20 odd years, uh, there has just, you know, and this, a lot of this is funding um, policy choices by various administrations, policy choices within um, you know, federal agencies. We have not really had um, an effective way to have sort of, you know, what we had in the Cold War, the distant early warning system. I think we actually still have it. You know, you know the distant early warning system for folks who are not Cold War historians um, is, you know, a set of radars ringing in the northern part of the United States and Canada and Alaska that would 
warn about missiles coming from Russia, Soviet Union to be specific, um, and attacking the US back in the days um, of the Cold War. And um, obviously now the, the enemies that are generated and, and sent, um, and you know how much of that's intentional, how much that's sloppy, how much of that's bad public health, whatever. I'm not going to comment on that. Everybody knows enough to form, formulate their own um, opinions here. But now the real vector is are these viruses that have heavily mutated across these multiple populations of animals, right? So they're super breeding pools because they're they're you know, they're almost forced transmission species to species to species. So they, the viruses tend to be a lot different than what we have. And we have not had a public health infrastructure to do this. What we found in many, in many places is, um, and what you've seen, of course, is uh, this year a Herculean effort to try to get as much data as possible. Um, and so you've seen, um, for those of you who are providers, all kinds of mandated reports on hospital beds, ICU beds, COVID test results, ventilators, a lot of mandated reporting out there. Um, but you know, these reports are ultimately sort of one-off reports. They're not really reusable. They do inform public policy and resource allocation, but they're not really what I think we would jointly think of as fitting a modern bi-directional concept of exchange, right? There are all things that are customized for single purpose. You know, the next time you have a question about the pandemic, you have to send out another edict on a mandated report. They don't use the broad range of clinical data. Again, they need to have predefined clinical questions. If our epidemiologic question changes, we're um, out of luck with, you know, the reports we have. And so we have an opportunity thinking of the health information exchanges really as public utilities um, and very powerful public utilities because they're basically, as far as I know, all nonprofits. And they also are, you know, while they're today are hospitals and doctors, as we know, they will increasingly cover all other manners of caregivers that interact in this clinical social welfare space. So you're going to see a lot more with nursing homes, home care, group homes, shelters, frankly, schools and jails over time as we get more of the social determinants of health and the impact of health there. And so the HAEs are really ground zero for single, you know, transmission of data to one spot and then with the potential to share that as people have the, the legal right to do so and no further um, as they have exercised those public rights and responsibilities to give us a rich picture in a seamless, as rapid, as secure, as efficient, and as comprehensive a view as possible. Um, we've seen some great progress we're, you know, doing some, um, we've done some funding and we're looking to see what other funding might be available um, to um, get, you know, get richer interactions between the state public health agencies, um, the federal agencies and um, the state health information exchanges. We think this is extraordinary. And let me share with you a little bit that, that, sounds, that sounds like a little bit of a policymaker perspective, but let me share with you a little bit of the clinical perspective. And frankly, to be told, I hadn't really thought about this very much before COVID, but um, so the questions we can answer around COVID are highly dependent on whether we can get at patient identifiable data. One of the challenges with mandated reporting, especially going to federal agencies, the states do get, um, you know, the name of a person and, and potentially an address, but I think I have a very hard time <coughs> figuring out provider context, how would they would do contact tracing for any of the richer things, or frankly, um, not being funded in a position 
to maintain robust electronic medical record type of functionality at the state level. I think historically it's been more of a case uh, case um, control type of functionality. But having what are largely de-identified things, it'll tell you, you know, how many COVID tests were done, um, or you know, maybe supply chain things like how many beds or ventilators. But the questions we really want to know, and to some extent still want to know, is how do patients move over time, right? So if you have a positive test, how long does it take for you to get a negative test? How long does it take for you to show evidence of immunity? What's the range of that curve of developing immunity? Um, how many, per, what percent of people develop immunity? What's the relationship of, of COVID illness and immunity to um, underlying factors that, you know, the clinical other diseases, you know, so-called comorbidities, relationships to medications that patients on, um, good or bad. Uh, what's the relationship to race and ethnicity? Um, you know, what are our specific risk factors? Um, you know, how does this play out with age? How does it play out over time? How does it play out geographically with hotspots that we might want to do, um, you know, take special approaches to? All of those things really require patient identifiable data. And then, of course, that puts a huge burden on the health information changes um, in what skills they've been very good at which are privacy protections, robust data use agreements, and then all the downstream technology things. And, and we know those, but they're so important, they're worth mentioning. So things like patient matching, data duplicate, deduplication, data normalization. That's the powerful role that health information exchanges play. I can assure you there's an increasing awareness of this in Washington. I think you will see more. Um, um, you know, throughout the policy spectrum um, here as, as folks think about how can we be maximally smart about this. Um, those, are, those are important, you know, these are important issues for this and future pandemics. Um, I think, you know, as I, as I sort of conclude here and invite folks to think about uh, questions um, and, or comments, um, I think we also have to think What's the role of health information exchanges in that, you know, underpinning of transparency? Um, I know Yuhin does a lot of work with claims, and um, I, I think the financial part and the clinical part are going to merge together over time. So I, I think this world of data and having true interoperability and exchanges in a way that is very pro-public and does not lock in the data does not create more gatekeepers and toll takers. We've seen a number of gatekeeping toll take, taking situations in healthcare uh, with data over the decades. Um, and um, because health is really a public good, largely paid for when you get down to all the ways it's paid for or subsidized by the taxpayers and, and the public, um, we need to have these core things um, be efficient, um, given that you know the programs they service are also creations of the government for better or worse. Um, so with that, hopefully I've given you a sense of um, some of the excitement. Um, I think this is, uh, you know, these are exciting times for health information exchange. I congratulate the UHIN folks on all the great work you guys have done and everybody on the, the event for um, your work and um, linking with you, Han. I think there's way, way, way more to come. And um, with that, let me throw it open to uh, any questions, comments. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Rucker. And we do already have some questions rolling in. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, we do have uh, a place for questions in the Zoom app. You can also send them through Whova. So please take a moment to look at your webinar controls first. You will see a button there titled Q&A that you can use to send in questions. Uh, if they do come in through Whova, we will get them as well. Uh, but if you can, go ahead and use Zoom because if you do, everyone will be able to see your question and other attendees can upvote it to bring that question to the top of the list. Now, right. and I'm going to rely on you, Sarah, for, for vetting through the questions. And 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, I'll get you over to them as they come in. Now, the Great. first Thanks. one, uh, we already had one come in. It says, uh, was the HIT certification program successful and will it be renewed or extended? All right. Um, so as, as folks know, just as background, I think everybody knows, but you know, you know what they say when you assume things. Um, the uh, ONC started back in 2004, really as an encouragement agency. And then in 2009, with a um, literally $30 billion stimulus package, it was really more about economic stimulus than anything else. Um, as part of, of, of a, you know, an attempt at accountability for spending that money, um, ONC got into the certification program. As people also know that ended up in what was called the Meaningful Use Program. And, um, you know, I think we're all aware that the Meaningful Use Program has, um, it didn't work out, I think, fully the way that people hoped. Um, I think we'll leave it, we'll leave it at that. And in fact, much of it, frankly, has already been dismantled um, when you look at it. And most of, pretty much all of that was actually done um, in the prior administration, just because the things didn't, didn't really um, play out. Um, there's a zillion details about that. We could spend hours going through nook and cranny. I think if you look at the IT certification program now, our automated test suites, suites our focus on APIs. It, the, the focus is, I think, pretty clearly on connectivity and interoperability that I, I do think um, there's a valuable role, um, you know, for that type of activity. Um, it's not dissimilar um, to things done in, you know, in the electrical standards world. I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot of standards organizations um, and, you know, they sort of, um, many of these sort of are at that boundary of public and private with, you know, public policy incentives and mandates, but lots of private participation. Um, I would put the oh, it's the I, our IT certification program into that. As folks know, we have the um, you know our interoperability standards advisory that we maintain on an updated basis, and it increasingly has global reach. Um, so it's it's really a team effort. We do a lot of funding of HL7 um, and various other sort of standards groups to, to get these things going that are, are um, groups in the private sector so we can incorporate that. Um, so I think when you ask the question of will the IT certification program continue, <clears throat> I think the answer is likely yes. Um, but um, again, that's, you know, there's always a future to things, but I think what you're going to see is it's a more narrowly um, and tightly focused scope, um, first and foremost, on interoperability. So thanks for that. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, for another question. Um, so we do have a, a current rule that is out there, and there was a recent announcement that enforcement of that rule, uh, that the timing of that would be pushed back a bit. Um, do you foresee the possibility of any further changes to that enforcement timeline based on how the COVID situation continues to develop? Um, no, I don't. Um, you know, I, again, the, the, the timing was really done uh, about the, uh, you know, was really reflects what we perceived and heard from stakeholders on the you know, the readiness and the resources in the provider community around the information technology. Um, I think when you look, I mean, if COVID has shown anything, we probably would have been much better off had we had all these APIs three years ago. So we're a little bit, frankly, behind the curve on all of this. And, um, you know, we, we had a lot of comment. It was actually sort of a tough call, you know, given the needs for COVID and telehealth and communication with telehealth and patients trying to be virtual and patients take, trying to take care of themselves, 
do we want to like accelerate these things, let alone, and we got lots of stakeholder advice to do that. Um, you know, this is sort of where we drew the balance, but um, I, I don't think so. Again, again, most of what's in the rule are some pretty straightforward application programming interfaces and some policies on sharing that hopefully people already have. And hopefully people aren't doing a lot of quote unquote information blocking. Um, and our understanding is that pretty much all of the major EHR vendors actually already have fire APIs. Um, so we think that the, that part of the technology is not a future, but really exists. Um, and, you know, the activity here is just vast. There was a, uh, a Dev Days uh, Fire Developer Conference early in the, in the beginning of the summer, 700 developers attended, just to give you a sense of that. Um, there's vast interest in this. I think we have finally, between you know RESTful, JSON, the RESTful APIs, JSON, Fire, I think we finally reached, um, as well as all of the vast underpinning of our you know, modern web economy, I think we finally reached something that looks to me like a sweet spot for interoperability. Um, and I'll, I'll, by way of background, just say, when I started um, in this whole thing, we were, it was before parallel ports on printers. And most of you guys probably don't even know what a parallel port on a printer is, let alone what came before it. So um, I've had plenty of chance to observe interoperability in all of its manifestations or lack thereof. And it just seems to me um, that it's really at that sweet spot. But I'm a pretty optimistic guy, obviously, I've been doing this for so long. So maybe, you know, dis discount, uh, discount that based on too much optimism. We'll leave, we'll leave that for you. I think we need optimism now. So I say go for it. Now, uh, we did have another question come in and uh, it says, uh, what work is being done by the ONC or is being planned vis-a-vis uh, -vis standardization of data from telehealth systems such as RPM? Um, can we just ask what RPM is? Is that a revenue cycle concept? I, what, I, I wanna make sure I know what RPM is. That is an excellent question. And uh, if the asker wants to, oh, here we go. Remote patient monitoring. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. Um, so yeah, these are hot issues. Um, you know, what we call um, patient generated data and patient reported data, right? Is, is sort of the way to look at it. Um, it's actually mandated in the Cures Act. The problem is there aren't any standards for it right now. We've done some funding of Ken Mandel, the Boston Children's Group, who did the smart on fire APIs that underlie the rule and are, are really um, very, very, very thoughtful, um, elegant API design um, thinkers and team builders. Um, the, you know, there's a couple things here to be um, unpacked. So one of the things to be unpacked is obviously just what standards do we need for all the devices that are gonna be in the internet of things? And we're already seeing this, you know, if you have an Apple smartwatch um, and it's, you know, measuring your EKG or your pulse ox um, and, you know, there's literally dozen, dozens, um, I think there's a company called Wivings, Withings, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, that I'm told has something like on the order of 200 digital devices. So, you know, we're, you know, increasingly generating a huge set of digital um, device data. Uh, my primary care doc said he wanted me to get a uh, digital blood pressure cuff with Bluetooth, so I'm getting that. And we'll see, you know, in the, in the <laughs> delivered, I think tomorrow or something. So we'll see what, you know, what shakes out there. A little, uh, that's self-experimentation. Um, and uh, so a, a vast sea of things. I believe what you're going to find, the real, those things aren't really going to be fully effective until each of those devices has some type of summarization data. There's just too much data 
obviously if if a doc has a thousand patients in a panel, um, they can't be looking at a thousand twenty four hour rhythm strips, right? It, it just doesn't doesn't com compute. So I think the 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 rub and the success will be in all the software and the APIs that sit on these devices and decide to surface what things, decide to surface it to whom, decide to surface it how. I think it is way too early um, for any government agency to be doing that. The um, FDA on some level has prohibitions against some of that. That's a nuanced thing um, under the Cures Act. I don't wanna get into the exact line of the FDA um, authorities. But um, the, the other part of that is patient reported data, right? I'm feeling fine. I'm feeling sick. Um, and, you know, in, in the most basic type of things. And I think the challenge there is, again, an API challenge, an ADT feed challenge, potentially, a messaging challenge. Um, we haven't really come up with elegant ways of doing that either in terms of formats. You know, we have the direct trust, some of the secure email, but, you know, that, and, um, you know, I know the direct trust working on secure messaging. There's probably others. Um, I think the HAEs obviously have a, a powerful role with, with messaging um, as they're doing in many cases with ADT. So I think we there's still more work to be done on sort of you know the messaging formats a, the data formats b, and then maybe most importantly, what are the practice parameters to to ingest this information, have a conversation with patients? You know that that requires probably uh, you know totally rethinking tools, and um, I think you know the proverbial inbox is a bit of a blunt instrument for that. Um, you know, some of the HIPAA rules on data out will probably need to get changed um, in, in various ways. Some of that will be fueled by, you know, the increase in biometrics and all kinds of new ways of identifying patients um, that will allow us to provide, um, you know, more security in terms of, you know, conducting conversations with patients. So that question has a lot of different components to it. Hopefully I've given you a little bit of flavor of all the pieces that need to be thought out there um, to um, start, you know, to do, make further progress. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more questions. There is another one that came in through Whova. Thank you. It looks like this one says, uh, as our networks expand to include more people, it's harder to correctly identify whom messages are intended for. Uh, simply using name and birth date is inadequate. Social security numbers would have been useful as a universal identifier, uh, but with that being protected, are, are there other solutions being considered for a universal identifier? Um, so, um, well, so this is the patient matching problem, um, which um, is, is, has been a perennial issue. Um, we are charged by Congress in the um, in last year's budget to do a report um, on patient matching. As folks knows, we've um, had um, testimony from, we've had three patient matching open listening session type of days um, over the course of the spring and summer. We've heard presentations from dozens, maybe a hundred maybe a little bit more of uh, different um, organiz folks and organizations on approaches here. Um, it's, it's a thorny issue. Um, you know, we already have, as the questioner points out, um, you know, a number of national identifiers, you know, the new Medicare number, um, state IDs, you know, driver's license, you know, um, per, per, personal ID. Um, and social security number. I'm not sure what the privacy protections of social security numbers are. I think there's an entire industry of selling social security number verification, um, you know, reverse matching, all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, wasn't designed for what, what it's being used for. My sense is in a modern world, 
and it is also worth noting there are a number of entities that already essentially match every person in the United States. So if you look at most of the big payers, um, they're doing it. Um, you know, folks like SureScripts are doing it. Certainly the credit reporting agencies are all doing it. So there are a lot of folks who have almost a complete coverage of the United States. Um, and then there's a whole set of back um, behind the scenes folks who um, verify patient identity. So for example, when you cash a check using your smartphone, they're not just because, right? Because you can, um, if you have some nefarious folks at, at the cell operators, you can get the device ID, match up the number and spoof that away, but you can't spoof you know, use patterns, the browser profile um, on the phone or on a web-based, on a you know, desktop type web-based browser. So there are, and people have thousands of data points they can use to verify. So I think what we're gonna find is this background verification, obviously with phones having more and more biometrics. Um, I think we're gonna get to a much higher consumer grade level um, fueled by these things, fueled by multiple services. So I don't think the classic, um, you know, here's your number type of thing will fly. And then there are also some very specific political policy questions to be decided by the body politic on what do we do with people who are in the country illegally, right? If that number is, you know, 10 or 11 million folks, which, you know, people have claimed in various election type of discussions, that's 3% of the population. That's a pretty high error rate out the, out the, what, you know, out the, you know, starting gate. So um, hopefully I've given you, um, you know, ONC is putting report together. I don't want to prejudge that, um, but at least as I've been thinking about these things, um, hopefully I've given you a flavor of the types of considerations that need to come in and the extraordinary advance of technology that is, um, you know, underneath any, you know, more explicit federal ID mandates. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you. And then uh, let's do uh, possibly one last question, possibly two, depending on uh, what's in queue here. So um, you did mention earlier in response to another question that the timeline for uh, implementation and enforcement of the currently passed rules is um, going forward as far as we know as scheduled. Um, now, are you able to just clarify for the audience, uh, are any parts of that rule potentially open to changes depending on what's happening in the administration or are all parts of that rule completely locked down going forward? Um, well, um, without getting into changes of administration, um, the, uh, so the way that this works, so first of all, our delay rule actually has public comment on it. So folks can, you know, comment on it. Um, I think um, if I put my predictive hat on, it's, it's worth understanding that this is a pretty bipartisan effort. And I would just point out to folks that um, the Cures Act and all of the writing of all of that, including the provisions around um, information blocking, um, APIs without special effort and TEFCA were actually done in, uh, with um, a lot of work by um, Karen DeSalvo and the prior administration. Um, so, and you know, we, we know that prior administration. So I, I think what you're gonna find is, um, you know, this is very bipartisan. The Cures Act was passed almost unanimously. Um, and um, I am not aware personally of any particular partisan cleavage lines on any of this. Um, and given that uh, things like the, all the provisions of the Cures Act that we've implemented in the rule, um, the HAEs themselves 
were started by um, the Obama Biden administration. Um, I believe you can, you know, interpret that as you may. All right, thank you very much. And I'm not seeing any other questions and we are just about two to three minutes from time. So uh, if there's no other last minute questions then we just may go ahead and uh, let you go. But thank you again so much, Dr. Rucker for your time and your expertise and for answering all of our attendee questions. Uh, we greatly oh, appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it's always a delight to work with you, you Hen. Um, I know you guys are doing some amazing stuff and uh, all of the best wishes to everybody. Stay safe. And uh, I look forward to being back in the greater Salt Lake City area in the very near future. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Thank you. Once it's safe to travel, right. we'll welcome you back here too. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care, Dr. Rucker.